Chapter One of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Ten. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Russell Newton. Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Ten, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter One: Franklin and Nashville. While Sherman was planning his march to the sea, General Hood was devising a counter-scheme of invasions. In spite of the rebuffs he had suffered at every encounter of arms since he had attained the object of his ambition by replacing Johnston, his hope and his courage had suffered no diminution. He had come to the West thoroughly imbued, as he says, with the spirit of Lee and Jackson. He thought by persisting in a series of flank attacks he would sooner or later destroy the National Army. His courage and energy were equal to any demands that could be made upon them. His mental capacity was so limited that he was unable to see the obstacles in his way. Even now, after all the wasteful defeats which his rashness had inflicted upon his army, he was dreaming of a succession of victories more brilliant than any which had illustrated the career of his great prototype in Virginia. Although he had retreated from the front of Sherman on the unanimous report of all officers he consulted that his army was in no condition to fight a pitched battle with Sherman's force, yet even while he halted at the crossroads he decided, he says, to cross the Tennessee at Cuntersville, to destroy Sherman's communications, to move upon Thomas and Schofield, and rout and capture their armies before they could reach Nashville. He intended then, we are quoting his own words, to march upon that city where he would supply his army and reinforce it by accessions from Tennessee. He would then march northeast, pass the Cumberland River, move into Kentucky, take position with his left at Richmond and his right at Hazel Green, then, threatening Cincinnati, recruit his army from Kentucky and Tennessee. The dream that had beguiled Kirby Smith still had power with Hood. The former state, he said, was reported at this juncture to be more aroused and embittered against the Federals than at any period of the war. He was imbued, he said, with the belief that he could accomplish this stupendous feat while Sherman was debating the alternative of following him or marching through Georgia. But this scheme was merely the prelude to greater achievements. If Sherman should return to confront him or should follow him from Georgia into Tennessee and Kentucky, he hoped then to be in condition to offer battle, and if blessed with victory, to send reinforcements to General Lee, or to march through the gaps in the Cumberland Mountains and take Grant in rear. Even if Sherman should beat him, he considered that this enterprise was still open to him. Thus, he says, he believed he could defeat Grant and allow General Lee, in command of our combined armies, to march upon Washington or turn upon and annihilate Sherman. This fantastic vision seemed as easy as good morning to the courageous heart and narrow mind of General Hood. Even as Sherman was to march southward, and little as he cared for what damage Hood might do in the rear, he was for a long time uncertain what course he should pursue in reference to him. On the 17th of October, he had said to Thomas that Hood would not dare to go into Tennessee. If he wants to, let him go, and then we can all turn on him and he cannot escape. And on the 26th, after his reconnaissance to Gadsden had revealed the fact that the rebel army had gone, he again said to Thomas, if it turns up at Guntersville, I will be after it. But if it goes, as I believe, to Decatur and beyond, I must leave it to you at present and push for the heart of Georgia. Even after he was satisfied that Hood had gone towards Decatur, he told Halleck that he would wait a few days to hear what headway Hood was making, and that he might yet turn to Tennessee, though it would be a great pity to take a step backward. I think, he adds with his humorous coolness, it would be better even to let him ravage the state of Tennessee provided he does not gobble up too many of our troops. Hood's intention, as we have seen, was really to cross at Guntersville, in which case he would have had Sherman upon his heels. But he postponed his ruin a few weeks by passing further west. The reason he gives for this course was his lack of cavalry and his desire to effect a junction with General Forrest before crossing. He did not even attempt to cross at Decatur, or at least the movement he made in this direction, which was promptly checked by General Granger in garrison there with considerable loss to the Federates, Hood insists, was intended merely as a slight demonstration. 
Sherman, though he sometimes complains of Hood's baffling eccentricities, seems to have read his mind on many occasions like an open book. He telegraphed on the 28th of October, not knowing of the result at Decatur, that Hood would not assault that place and that Granger did not want too many men. The next day he received information of Hood's feeble demonstration against it and of Granger's successful sortie, in which he killed and wounded a considerable number of Confederates and captured over a hundred. Granger added his belief that Hood would go to Tuscumbia before crossing. He was evidently out of supplies, as the first thing the prisoners asked for was something to eat. Hood continued on his way west and reached Tuscumbia, on the south bank of the Tennessee, on the 31st of October. General Grant's doubts of the wisdom of Sherman's movement southward, which were so strong on this 1st of November that he recommended him to beat Hood before he started, gave way before Sherman's intense eagerness to be off, and on the second, as we have seen, he gave his full consent. From that moment there was no question that one of the gravest responsibilities of the war rested upon the broad shoulders of General Thomas. This weighty load was well placed. Sherman said, General Thomas is well alive to the occasion, and better suited to the emergency than any man I have. He might have gone further and said that no man then alive on the continent was better suited to the work in hand. Grant, it is true, never rated Thomas at his real value, but he acquiesced in Sherman's opinion on this as on almost all other occasions. Sherman's confidence was full and unlimited. He issued an order that in the event of military movements or the accidents of war separating the general in command from his military division, Major General George H. Thomas, commanding the Department of the Cumberland, would exercise command over all the troops and garrisons not absolutely in the presence of the General-in-Chief. The departments of the Ohio and Tennessee were thus placed completely under his command. Thomas had not sought these honors or responsibilities. He accepted them most reluctantly. I do not wish, he said, to be in command of the defense of Tennessee unless you and the authorities in Washington deem it absolutely necessary. But having once accepted the charge, he executed it with all that human courage and human wisdom could bring to the task. During the whole month of November, the situation was extremely grave. Hood's army had, by the utmost exertion, been recruited up to its full strength. He himself says that desertions had ceased, and he started, at least, with his organization perfect and his subordinate generals entirely in harmony with him, now that Hardy was gone. With three corps of infantry, commanded by General S. D. Lee, Cheatham, and Stuart, comprising a force variously estimated at from 40,000 to 45,000, and he was accompanied beside by a formidable body of cavalry under Forrest of 10,000 to 12,000. Thomas's force was, on the 1st of November, greatly inferior to that of Hood. A large part of it was dispersed along the garrison post of the southern frontier of Tennessee, and this, of course, could not be displaced. His movable force he estimated at 22,000 infantry and a little over 4,000 cavalry. He received about this time some 12,000 new recruits from the north, but these did not make up his losses by the expiration of terms of service and by the furloughing of soldiers going north. The forces upon which he most relied were the 4th Corps, under Stanley, and the 23rd Corps, under Schofield, and he was promised in addition to these an excellent corps under A.J. Smith, which had been serving temporarily under Rosecrans. At the time of the Battle of Nashville, however, Thomas had at hand of all arms about 55,000. As soon as Thomas learned that Hood had appeared in force on the Tennessee, Schofield and Stanley were ordered to be concentrated at Pulaski. But before this could be accomplished, Forrest had made an attack at Johnsonville, one of Thomas's bases of supply on the Tennessee River, and after a feeble and discreditable resistance on the part of the garrison of the place, had caused the destruction of several transports and a large amount of valuable government property. Schofield arrived at Nashville on the 5th, when the advance of his corps was immediately dispatched to Johnsonville by rail. But on reaching there, he found that Forrest, having done all the damage possible, had retreated. Schofield left the place sufficiently garrisoned, and with the rest of his command, 
marched to join the Fourth Corps at Pulaski and to assume command of all the troops in that vicinity. Though Stanley's commission as Major General antedated this, Schofield had the higher rank as commander of a department. His orders from Thomas were to retard the advance of Hood into Tennessee as much as possible, without risking a general engagement, until Smith's command should arrive from Missouri, and General J. H. Wilson, who had put in command of all the cavalry in the department, and who came endorsed by Grant with the prediction that he would increase the efficiency of that arm 50%, had time to remount the cavalry regiments whose horses had been taken for Kilpatrick. A fortnight had been spent by Hood and Beauregard at Tuscumbia, and the contemplated campaign discussed by them in all its bearings. On the 6th of November, Hood telegraphed to Jefferson Davis his intention to move into Tennessee, to which Mr. Davis answered that if Sherman, as reported, had sent a large part of his force southward, you may first beat him in detail and subsequently, without serious obstruction or danger to the country in your rear, advance to the Ohio River. On the 12th, which was the day on which communication ceased between Sherman and Thomas, Hood telegraphed again to the Confederate President, giving his reasons for not having fought Sherman, saying he did not then regard his army as in proper condition for a pitched battle, but that it was now in excellent spirits and confidence. He also accounted for his delays of the last few weeks by saying that Forrest had not been able to join him, that as soon as he could come up, which would be in a few days, he should move forward. He moved across to Florence on the north bank of the Tennessee on the 13th. Forrest reported the next day, and Hood brought his entire army across the river. Sherman's intentions were not long a secret to the Confederates, and, his formidable movement to the south being now fully developed, Beauregard ordered Hood, on the 17th of November, to take the offensive at the earliest practicable moment, striking the enemy while thus dispersed, and by these means distract Sherman's advance into Georgia. And on the same day, telegraphing to General Howell Cobb, who was reporting in panic and terror the advance of Sherman, Beauregard said, Victory in Tennessee will relieve Georgia. Three days later, Beauregard again charged Hood to push on active offensive immediately, and on the 21st Hood, with his usual alacrity, put his army in motion, feeling sure that he was to gain the victory so much needed and desired. The storms which in Sherman's neighborhood had been no more than refreshing showers, in Middle Tennessee had turned the roads to mire. Neither Schofield nor Thomas believed that it was possible for the Confederates to move in such weather. But nevertheless, Hood pushed forward with his habitual vigor intent on coming upon Schofield's rear and cutting him off from Columbia. And in this daring plan, he almost succeeded. In spite of snow, sleet, and rain, he pushed northward, and it was only by an equally vigorous and energetic march on the night from the 23rd to the 24th of November that Schofield reached Columbia first. Forrest's cavalry was on the Mount Pleasant Pike almost in sight of the town when Cox's division moved at double quick, marched across from the Pulaski Road, and held back the Confederates until Stanley's head of column arrived and a strong position was taken up by the whole command, covering the town on the south. Disappointed in his first effort to march around Schofield, Hood determined to proceed by the right flank, crossing the river some distance above Columbia and move upon Schofield's line of communications at Spring Hill. He had not yet given up his hope of renewing in the West the exploits of Stonewall Jackson. I had beheld, he said, with admiration the noble deeds and grand results achieved by the immortal Jackson in similar maneuvers. He waited only one day to prepare this movement, and as he had always thought since the 22nd of July, that if he had been present, in Hardy's flanking movement he could have destroyed McPherson's army, he determined this time to accomplish a closer imitation of Jackson at Chancellorsville by riding at the head of his own flanking column. He bridged the river during the night of the 28th, three miles above Columbia, and crossing at daybreak, he rode at the head of Granbury's brigade of Cleburne's division, giving instructions to remaining corps in to follow and to keep well closed up. He left General S. D. Lee at Columbia with two divisions and most of the artillery to make a heavy demonstration against Schofield and to follow him if he retired. 
In anticipation of this movement, Stanley had been sent with two divisions of the Fourth Corps to Spring Hill, Cox having been left at Columbia to prevent or delay Hood's crossing there. Colonel P. S. Post's brigade was at the same time sent up the river in observation, and soon reported the movement of infantry north of the stream. Fearing that this force, the strength of which was not yet developed, might come in upon the flank near Rutherford's Creek, Nathan Kimball's division halted at that point, while Stanley passed on with G. D. Wagner's division to Spring Hill, where he arrived a little before noon. In the meantime, Forrest had been encountered by Wilson near Hertz Corners, and a brisk engagement took place between them, Forrest, with his larger superior force, gradually crowding Wilson to the north in such a way as to give the Confederates command of the direct road from Rally Hill to Spring Hill. When Stanley, with his one division, arrived at the latter point, there was brisk skirmishing on every side of him for the possession of the road, which increased throughout the afternoon. The disposition made of Wagner's division was admirably effective. Emerson Opdyke's and J. Q. Lane's brigades covering the village and protecting the trains, while L. P. Bradley occupied a wooded knoll some three-quarters of a mile east of the pike, which commanded the approaches from that direction. By great good fortune, Wagner had not only his own battery of artillery, but Captain Lyman Bridges, the artillery chief of the Corps, had come up with six more batteries, not with any idea of fighting a battle, but simply to get them as far as possible on the road to Franklin. But the moment he arrived at Spring Hill, scenting the conflict, he placed all his guns in battery on a commanding point west of the road, where they did efficient service. The first demonstration upon the place came from Cheatham's Corps, which Hood accompanied in person, having left Stewart's Corps at Rutherford's Creek. Claiborne's division, one of the finest in the Confederate Army, under command of a general whose fighting qualities were proverbial, was so hotly received by Bradley's small brigade and by the utterly disproportionate fire from Bridges' batteries that it was impossible for the Confederates to believe that the force opposed to them was so small. Bradley's brigade was, however, very roughly handled. Its heroic commander being severely wounded, it fell back under charge of Colonel Joseph Conrad towards the road, and there, with Lane's and Opdyke's brigades, made so stout a resistance that evening came on, to Hood's almost frantic disappointment, before the Franklin Pike was reached. As he saw himself missing the great stroke upon which he had built such hopes, he assailed his generals with furious reproaches and adjurations. Bringing up Stuart from Rutherford's Creek, he threw him to the right of Cheatham, with orders to take the pike at all hazards, although night had already fallen. But it was too late. Stuart's men went into bivouac within a few hundred yards of the road which Wagner's division, by good fighting and admirable judgment on the part of everybody concerned, still held, and with it the salvation of Schofield's army. General Lee had succeeded in retaining General Cox with the 23rd Corps all day at Columbia. In the afternoon, Schofield, becoming convinced that Hood, with his main army, was moving upon his rear, ordered Cox to withdraw as soon as it was dark. He himself took T. H. Ruger's division and pushed for Spring Hill. The enemy was so close to the road that Schofield had repeatedly to brush his pickets away from the path as he advanced. He reached Spring Hill about seven o'clock, and there learned that Thompson Station, a few miles further north, was occupied by the enemy. Posting a strong force to the east of the road to protect his marching column, he hurried on with Ruger's division to Thompson's station, the enemy retiring as he approached. He then returned to Spring Hill, meeting there the head of Cox's column, which had come up with the greatest celerity from Columbia. The whole force then started for Franklin and marched all night with its heavy trains and invaluable artillery past the sleeping army of Hood. Several times during the night the trains were delayed by slight obstructions, and it seemed as if they must be abandoned or a battle be fought to save them. But by mingled good fortune and good management they all got through, the head of the column arriving at Franklin a little before daylight on the 30th and the rest coming up during the forenoon. Schofield's orders were to cross the Harpeth River, to hold Hood in check there, and retire gradually upon Nashville for Thomas now felt ready to fight at that place. 
Smith's detachment of the Army of the Tennessee had at last begun to arrive from Missouri, and Thomas was now equal or superior in infantry to Hood. But, to Schofield's surprise and annoyance, he found no means of crossing the river. He had destroyed his pontoons at Columbia, they being too heavy and cumbrous for the transportation at his disposition. Those he had requested from Nashville had not been set. The light and movable train, which had belonged to Thomas's army, had gone with Sherman to Georgia. A staff and an army like that of Schofield's waste no time in regrets. They scarped the banks on both sides of the river and made a sort of ford. They tore several houses to pieces and with the planking floored the railroad bridge. They sawed the old posts of the country bridge down to the level of the water and hastily covered the stumps with planks. Thus, in a few hours, they had three practicable bridges and began at once crossing the artillery and trains. T.J. Wood's division, with some guns, took position in an abandoned work called Fort Granger on the north side, where they commanded the bridges. But while these operations were going on, it became necessary to provide for receiving Hood's attack on the other side of the village. The 23rd Corps was posted on both sides of the main road, upon which Hood's army was expected. The village of Franklin stands in a bend of the Harpeth River, so that Cox, who commanded the lines, had his left on the stream and extended across the Columbia Pike to the Carter's Creek Pike, but could not reach the bend of the river on the other side. Kimball's division was therefore given the duty of closing the line on that flank. The instant the men were assigned their positions, they went to work with instinctive alacrity to build such slight breastwork as the means at hand afforded. The roadway was left open to enable a double line of wagons and artillery to pass, and this opening was protected by a retrenchment a few rods further back. Wagner's division, which had held the lines at Spring Hill all the day before, and which had brought up the rear in a long night march, came in about noon. Colonel Opdyke's brigade, which had formed the rear guard, and upon which had fallen the double duty of beating back Hood's advance and driving forward the weary and limping recruits of the Schofield's army, now came inside the lines and was posted as a reserve in rear of the center. Wagner's other two brigades were left outside the principal line about half a mile forward on the Columbia Pike with instructions to observe the enemy and to retire as soon as the Confederates showed a disposition to advance in force. The weary soldiers threw themselves down for a little repose behind their breastworks. Neither Schofield nor his corps commander imagined that a great battle was to burst upon them in a few moments. The artillery and trains were nearly all across the river by the middle of the afternoon, and Schofield had issued orders for the troops to pass over at six o'clock. But there was a state of things in the Confederate Army which made any moderate or prudent measures impossible to Hood. His failure to destroy Schofield at Spring Hill had so embittered and exasperated him that he was ready for any enterprise, however desperate. The irritation had communicated itself to his principal officers. His reproaches had stung them beyond endurance, and, therefore, on arriving in sight of Schofield's army, in position on the south bank of the Harpeth, there was no thought of anything among the Confederate commanders but immediate and furious attack. All the Confederate accounts agree in describing the spirit in Hood's army on the morning of the 30th of November, though Hood and his generals entirely disagree to the cause of it. Generals Cheatham and John C. Brown, and, according to their account, General Cleburne also, ascribed it to Hood's unreasonable and angry censures of their conduct the day before, while Hood attributes the new spirit of the army to mortification for the great opportunity lost and a renewed assess of admiration and confidence towards himself. The assault was made at about four o'clock. The Confederates never rushed forward to battle with more furious impetus, and by a strange accident it seemed for a moment as if this desperate assault of Hood was to succeed, and he was to gain the glory he so ardently longed for of a success like Stonewall Jackson's best. Wagner's two brigades, that had been left outside the line with instructions to retire before becoming actually engaged with the enemy, stayed too long. The wide and heavy lines of Cheatham and Stuart had enveloped them on both flanks, and the bayonets of the hood center were almost touching them when they turned and ran for the Union lines. 
They rushed over the parapets on either side of the pike, the Confederates following immediately after them, overwhelming and carrying to the rear the troops who were defending the breastworks. A gap of about 1,000 feet was instantly made in the Union lines. Hood's battalions were rapidly converging to this point. If the damage were not immediately repaired, it would be irreparable. With the superior force wedged into the Union center, short work would have been made of the two wings, and nothing but annihilation would have been left for Schofield's army. General D. S. Stanley, the commander of the Fourth Corps, seeing from the north side of the river the Confederate advance, started at the instant for his line. He reached it just as the breach was made and the confused mass of fugitives and Confederates came pouring to the rear. The only force available at the instant to meet them was Opdyke's brigade, which had fought all the day before at Spring Hill and afterwards had marched all night. But even while Stanley was galloping to order Opdyke to lead his men to the charge, he saw that gallant commander taking position himself on the right of his line. Seeing that no orders were necessary, he gave none, but placed himself at the left of this heroic brigade. A shout rose among the veteran soldiers about him. We can go where the general can. And the brigade, supported on the right and left by Cox's men, who instantly rallied to the rescue, rushed forward and regained the lines. Opdyke's magnificent courage met its adequate reward. He fought on horseback till his revolver was empty, then dealt about him with the butt of his pistol, and descending from his horse, seized the musket of a fallen soldier and fought like a private until the entrenchments were regained. Although four regimental commanders fell in this furious charge, Opdyke was unhurt. Stanley did not fare so well. His horse was killed under him, and he received a serious wound in the neck and was carried to the rear. The battle did not cease with its fierce onset and repulse. All along the line the Confederates made attack after attack. Hood, sitting on horseback, a little way behind his lines, sent them forward again and again with furious orders to drive the Yankees into the river. To show with what desperate gallantry the Confederates were led, it need only be said that six generals were killed on or near the parapets, six were wounded, and one captured. Cleburne closed his brilliant career in front of the Union breastworks. John Adams charged his horse over the ditch, leaped it, and horse and rider were killed upon the parapet. General O. F. Strahl fought with his men in the ditch until evening came. He was struck down. He turned over the command to Colonel F. E. P. Stafford, but while his men were carrying him to the rear, he was struck twice more and killed. Stafford took up his fallen sword and carried on the fight with courage which will form the theme of fable and legend in time to come. An eyewitness says that his men were piled about him in such numbers that when at last he was shot dead he could not fall, but was found the next morning, partially upright, as if still commanding the gallant dead who surrounded him. Along the whole line the attack and defense were carried on until nothing but the flashes of the muskets could be seen in the darkness, with the same furious gallantry on the one side and the same immovable determination on the other. Few battles so frightfully destructive are recorded in the wars of modern times. In the terrible fight at Ezra Church, a Union picket shouted across the lines to a Confederate with that friendly chaff command to both armies, I say, Johnny, how many of you are there left? To which the undaunted Confederate replied, About enough for another killing. On this terrible afternoon at Franklin, Hood's army suffered the last killing it was able to endure. He admitted in his dispatch to Richmond a loss of about 4,500, but Thomas, in his careful report, foots the Confederate loss at 6,252, of which all but 700 were killed and wounded. Schofield's loss was very much less, amounting to 2,326 in all, of which Wagner's unfortunate division lost 1,200. Had it not been for the mistake made in those two advanced brigades, Schofield's army would have slaughtered Hood at its leisure. Thomas, in his grave and sober manner, thus sums up the result of this signal victory. It not only seriously checked the enemy's advance and gave General Schofield time to move his troops and all his property to Nashville, but it also caused deep depression among the men of Hood's army, making them doubly cautious in their subsequent movements. Schofield reported the day's work to Thomas, 
and by his advice and direction fell back during the night to Nashville. His retreat was entirely unmolested. For Wilson, while the battle was going on at Franklin, had met and checked Forrest, holding him at the river and driving some of his detachments back. Schofield's army, on arriving at Nashville, occupied a position selected for it in advance by General Thomas. General Schofield held the left extending to the Nolensville Pike. The 4th Corps, under the command of General Wood, held the center, and the 16th Corps, under General A.J. Smith, who had just arrived in time to assist in the defense of Tennessee, occupied the right, his flank resting on the Cumberland River below the city. Wilson, with his cavalry, was stationed first at Schofield's left, but Steedman's provisional command having arrived at Nashville on the evening of the 1st of December, Wilson was moved to the north side of the river, and Steedman occupied the space from Schofield's left to the Cumberland. Hood, as if driven by his evil genius, followed rapidly after Schofield and sat down before Nashville. He was aware, he said, of the reinforcements which had reached Thomas, and which had brought the strength of the National Army above his own, but he was in the position of a desperate gamester who had so little to lose that he feels it better policy to stake all than to leave the game. He knew that Mr. Davis was urgent in his orders for the reinforcement of the Army of Tennessee from Texas. He hoped that with this expected accession he might still realize the roseate dreams with which he had started out on this ill-starred campaign. He trusted to the chapter of accidents to give him some dazzling successes which would draw the Tennesseans and Kentuckians to his standard. He formed his line of battle in front of Nashville on the 2nd of December. Lee's corps took the center, astride the Franklin Pike, Stuart occupied the left, and Cheatham the right, their flanks widely extending toward the Cumberland River, and Forrest's cavalry filling the gap. But no sooner had he established himself there than, as if determined to give himself no chance in the impending battle, he detached Forrest on the 5th with W. B. Bates' division of infantry to invest and capture, if possible, the garrison of Murfreesboro, commanded by General Rousseau. This expedition totally failed. A sally was made on the 7th by some of Rousseau's troops under General Milroy, who won that day a merited consolation for his disaster at Winchester, and inflicted a sharp defeat upon Bates' infantry which was thereupon recalled to Nashville. While Forrest, in this useless adventure, remained away from Hood too far to be recalled when he was most needed. While General Hood was strengthening his entrenchments and waiting in vain for good news from Forrest, and the arrival of reinforcements from across the Mississippi, which were never to come, Thomas, upon his side, was completing in his unhurried and patient manner his preparations for a crushing blow. He would have been ready to strike in about a week after Hood's arrival. Nothing exhibits more vividly the tension of spirit which had come with four years of terrible war than the fact that the administration at Washington, which had patiently allowed McClellan to sit motionless in front of Johnston from July to February, began to urge Thomas to move against Hood within twenty-four hours of the victory at Franklin. General Grant felt and exhibited this impatience in a much stronger degree. He not only sent out daily messages urging immediate action, but betrayed an irritation which reads strangely in the light of Thomas's career. He carried this feeling much further than the civil authorities at Washington, though it is true that Mr. Stanton, in a strain of whimsical exaggeration, wrote to Grant on the 7th of December, If he, Thomas, waits for Wilson to get ready, Gabriel will be blowing his last horn. Grant the next day telegraphed to Halleck, if Thomas has not struck yet, he ought to be ordered to hand over his command to Schofield. Halleck replied, showing that the government at Washington, impatient as they felt for immediate action, cherished a higher regard for Thomas than that felt by the general-in-chief. If you wish General Thomas relieved, he said, give the order. No one here will, I think, interfere. The responsibility, however, will be yours, as no one here, so far as I am informed, wishes General Thomas removed. This dispatch saved General Thomas his command for a few days longer, but Grant refused to be placated. Thomas telegraphed him on the 8th in extenuation of his not having attacked Hood that he could not concentrate his troops and get their transportation in order in shorter time than it had been done. 
Halleck answered, expressing the deep dissatisfaction of Grant at Thomas's delay, and Grant, on the ninth, with growing indignation, requested Halleck to telegraph orders relieving Thomas at once and placing Schofield in command. These orders were immediately written out, but before they were transmitted to Nashville, Thomas reported in his usual manly and reasonable style, I regret that General Grant should feel dissatisfaction at my delay in attacking the enemy. I feel conscious that I have done everything in my power to prepare, and that the troops could not have been gotten ready before this. And if he should order me to be relieved, I will submit without a murmur. A terrible storm of freezing rain has come on since daylight, which will render an attack impossible till it breaks. On the receipt of this dispatch, the authorities took the responsibility of delaying the order for Thomas's relief until Grant could be consulted, and he, the same evening, suspended the order until, as he said, it is seen whether he will do anything. The spell of bad weather, announced by Thomas in this dispatch, continued for six days. It made any movement of either army impracticable. The rain froze as it fell, covering road and field with a thick coating of ice, upon which it was impossible for men to march, and on which every effort to move cavalry resulted in serious casualties to men and horses. General Grant knew this, but his fear that Hood might elude Thomas and lead him in a race to the Ohio River became so overpowering that it clouded his better judgment, and his dispatches of censure and vehement command came raining in day by day upon Thomas, causing that most subordinate and conscientious of soldiers exquisite pain, but never for an instant disturbing the calm equipoise of his mind. He replied from day to day, acknowledging the receipt of orders and promising to execute them at the earliest moment possible. The whole country, he said on the 11th, is covered with a perfect sheet of ice and sleet, and it is with difficulty that troops are able to move about on level ground. On the 12th it was no better. He again described in a dispatch the utter impossibility of moving men or horses, and his belief that an attack at this time would only result in a useless sacrifice of life. It is hard to believe, and painful to write, that after the receipt of this truthful and loyal statement, General Grant dispatched General John A. Logan, who was then visiting him at City Point, to relieve General Thomas at Nashville. He directed him, however, not to deliver the order or publish it until he reached his destination, and then, if Thomas had moved, not to deliver it at all. Even after Logan had started, Grant's uneasiness at the situation so gained upon him that he himself started for Nashville, and was met at Washington by news which electrified the country, saved General Thomas his command, and established him immutably in the respect and affection of his country. Thomas nowhere appears to greater advantage, not even on the hills of Chickamauga opposing his indomitable spirit and the surging tide of disaster and defeat, than he does during this week opposing his sense of duty to the will of his omnipotent superior, and refusing to move one hour before he thought the interests of the country permitted it, even under the threat of removal and disgrace. In answer to Halleck's last peremptory dispatch, he replied on the evening of the 14th of December, The ice having melted away today, the enemy will be attacked tomorrow morning. And the next night he sent this laconic dispatch, Attacked enemies left this morning, drove it from the river below city very nearly to Franklin Pike, distance about eight miles. The frightful storms of rain and sleet which had held Thomas as if spellbound had interfered equally with the mobility of Hood. Neither one nor the other could stir. Still, without the slightest trepidation, the Confederate chief waited for Thomas's attack, feeling sure, as he says in his report, that I could defeat him and thus gain possession of Nashville with abundant supplies for the army. This would give me possession of Tennessee. So late as the 11th of December, he wrote in a most encouraging strain to the Confederate Secretary of War, making suggestions as to his spring campaign, and saying with unconscious humor, I think the position of this army is now such as to force the enemy to take the initiative. On the morning of the 15th of December, in the midst of a heavy fog which masked the movements of Thomas's army, he threw it forward to the long-desired attack. It was the sort of weather which from time immemorial 
had been held as a justification for absolute inaction. The warm rains had changed the sleety roads and fields to a sea of mire, through which the troops floundered painfully. To divert Hood's attention from his real purpose, Thomas had ordered Steedman to demonstrate heavily with his command against the Confederate right, east of the Nolensville Pike, orders which that energetic commander carried out with such tumultuous zeal as to draw Hood's attention almost entirely to that side of the field. Wilson's cavalry and Smith's infantry corps then moved out along the hardened pike and commenced the grand movement of the day by wheeling to the left and advancing against the left flank of Hood's position. Wilson first struck the enemy along Richland Creek, which bounds the city on the west, and drove him rapidly, making numerous captures, until he came upon a detached redoubt intended as a protection to Hood's left flank, which was carried in splendid style by a portion of Edward Hatch's dismounted troopers. Another work and some hundreds of prisoners were immediately after captured by the combined assault of Smith's and Wilson's men. But finding that Smith had not gone as far to the right as he had hoped, Thomas directed Schofield to move the 23rd Corps to the right of General Smith, by this means enabling the cavalry to act more freely upon Hood's left flank and rear. Schofield's two divisions, admirably commanded by Generals Couch and Cox, marched with great spirit and swiftness to the position assigned them and gained ground rapidly all the afternoon. The 4th Corps, under General T.J. Wood, which held the center of the Union line, assaulted about one o'clock Hood's advanced position at Montgomery Hill, a gallant feat of arms executed by the brigade of Colonel P. Sidney Post. From this point a rapid advance was made, the whole line working steadily forward until Hood was driven everywhere from his position and forced back to a new line, having its right and left flank respectively on the Overton and the Brentwood Hills his left occupying a commanding range of hills on the east of the Franklin Pike. His center stretched across from that road to another a mile to the west called the Granny White Turnpike. Both flanks were refused and strongly entrenched to the east and west and to the south, while the main line fronted northward. The Union lines closed rapidly about him, and in this position both sides waited for the morning. The events of the day had filled the Union Army with confidence and enthusiasm, and at early dawn on the morning of the 16th, Thomas sent his whole line forward. Wood pressed the Confederate skirmishers across the Franklin Pike, and swinging a little to the right, advanced due south, driving the enemy before him, until he came upon his new main line of works, constructed during the night on Overton's Hill. Steedman marched out on the Nolensville Pike and formed on the left of Wood, the latter general taking command of both corps. Smith connected with Wood's right, his corps facing southward, while Schofield began the morning's work in the position where Knight had overtaken him, his line running almost due southward and perpendicular to that of Wood. Thomas now rode along the entire line surveying every inch of the field, and at last gave orders that the movement should continue against the Confederate left. His entire line was closely crowding that of Hood, there being only a space of six hundred yards between them. At about three o'clock, Post's brigade, which had on the day before so gallantly carried Montgomery Hill, was ordered by General Wood to assault the works on the Overton Heights. C. R. Thompson's brigade of colored troops of Steedman's command joined in this desperate enterprise. Our men, says Thomas, moved steadily onward up the hill until near the crest, when the reserve of the enemy rose and poured into the assaulting column a most destructive fire, causing the men first to waver and then to fall back, leaving their dead and wounded, black and white indiscriminately mingled, lying amidst the abatis, the gallant Colonel Post among the wounded. This was the only Confederate success of the day, but it was enough to excite the wildest hopes in the always sanguine breast of General Hood. Sitting on his horse and observing the repulse of Post's storming party, he says, I had matured the movement for the next morning. The enemy's right flank, by this hour, stood in air some six miles from Nashville, and I had determined to withdraw my entire force during the night and attack this exposed flank in rear, still intent on his reverent imitation of Stonewall Jackson. But even at the moment he was maturing this strategic scheme, his line, he says, broke at all points, 
and he beheld for the first and only time a Confederate army abandon the field in confusion. Immediately after Post's assault had failed, the commands of Smith and Schofield advanced to the work assigned them, and with marvelous celerity and success they burst over the enemy's works in every direction, carrying all before them, irreparably breaking his lines in a dozen places, and capturing all his artillery and thousands of prisoners. The result was so sudden and so overwhelming that neither side was quite prepared for it. Wilson had been making rapid progress with his cavalry on the extreme right, and had come to report his success to Thomas, who stood with Schofield directing operations. He saw the rush for the Confederate position, and galloped back to his command to share in the final struggle. But as Cox says, before he could get halfway there, the whole Confederate line was crushed in like an eggshell. The arch was broken, there were no reserves to restore it, and from the right and left the Confederate troops peeled away from the works in wild confusion. With the exception of the casualties in the gallant rush made by Post's and Thompson's brigades, Thomas's entire loss was but slight. The Confederates abandoned their artillery, rushed across the Granny White Road to the Franklin Pike, and poured in a disorganized mass down the only avenue to the south which was left open to them. No route during the war was ever more complete. Thomas captured in the two days 4,462 prisoners, including 287 officers of all grades from that of Major General, 53 pieces of artillery, and thousands of small arms. One or two of the brigades that still retained their organization formed as a rear guard on the Franklin Pike, under the command of S.D. Lee, and during the first hours of the night efficiently maintained a certain show of resistance to the pursuing cavalry. Night quickly closed in, and a drenching rain came down which made pursuit extremely difficult. General Grant was never satisfied with the swiftness and efficiency of Thomas's pursuit of Hood's beaten army. Yet with the exception of that historic chase which began at Petersburg and ended at Appomattox, there was no other pursuit of a beaten army during the war so energetic, so prolonged, and so fruitful. The cavalry column came up with the enemy's rear guard four miles north of Franklin. They charged it in front and flank, capturing 413 prisoners and three colors. They drove the Confederates through Franklin, capturing 2,000 wounded in the hospitals there, and liberated some hundreds of Union prisoners. The cavalry pressed on, followed by the infantry, who moved with such expedition as was possible over the frightful roads, encumbered by all the debris of two armies. On the 18th, the enemy crossed Harpeth River, destroying the bridges behind them. The profuse rains of the month now began to show their effects in the swollen watercourses. At Rutherford's Creek they found the stream, which was usually a rivulet, a foaming torrent. It took two days to get the command across. Material for a bridge over Duck River was hastily pushed forward to that point so that Wood crossed late on the 22nd and got into position on the Pulaski Road. Hood's army, though still retreating at the top of their speed, had by this time gained the powerful assistance of Forrest, who had joined them at Columbia, and Hood had formed a strong rear guard of 4,000 infantry under E.C. Walthall, Lee having been wounded on the 17th, and all his available cavalry. With the exception of his rear guard, says Thomas, his army has become a disheartened and disorganized rabble of half-armed and barefooted men, who sought every opportunity to fall out by the wayside and desert their cause to put an end to their sufferings. On Christmas morning, Thomas, still continuing the pursuit, drove the enemy out of Pulaski and chased him toward Lamb's Ferry over roads which had become almost impassable and through a country devoid of sustenance for man and beast. The Confederates were, however, more fleet than their pursuers. The swollen rivers and other accidents everywhere favored them, and during the 26th and 27th Hood crossed the Tennessee River. Even here he did not feel in safety, but continued his headlong retreat to Tupelo, Mississippi. From there, on the 13th of January, he sent a dispatch to the Confederate War Department requesting to be relieved from the command of the army. After consultation with General Beauregard, he issued furloughs to most of his Tennessee troops. His army, what there was of it, rapidly melted away. Four thousand of them went to join Maury at Mobile. It is hard to say what became of the rest. 
after the pressure of public opinion had forced the Richmond authorities to the bitter necessity of reappointing General Johnston to the command of that spectral army which was expected to oppose the triumphal march of Sherman to the north, the three corps of Hood's army which reported to him consisted of 2,000 men under C. L. Stevenson, S. D. Lee's successor, 2,000 under Cheatham, and 1,000 under Stuart. In addition to these there were, he says, little parties who gradually made their way into North Carolina as groups and individuals and were brought to him at last by General S. D. Lee. The pursuit of Hood's retreating army was not continued longer by Thomas. On the 29th of December, a small force of cavalry of only 600 men, under command of Colonel W. J. Palmer of the 15th Pennsylvania, went roving through North Alabama and Mississippi, striking the enemy here and there, destroying one day his pontoon trains, on another day a large supply train, sabering and shooting his mules, attacking the Confederate General W. W. Russell near Thorn Hill, routing him, capturing some prisoners, burning some wagons, and then proceeding at his leisure back to camp at Decatur, after a march of over 250 miles, reporting a loss of one killed and two wounded. Mr. Davis promptly complied with Hood's request for relief, and he bade farewell on the 23rd of January, 1865, to what was left of the army of 50,000 men which Johnston had led with such unfailing prudence and wisdom from Tunnel Hill to Atlanta, and which Hood had dashed to pieces against the national breastworks on every field from Atlanta to Nashville. Hood then visited Virginia, was kindly received by Jefferson Davis, with whom he always remained a favorite, even amid the impending ruin of the Confederacy, and was on his way to Texas with instructions to bring a new army from that remote but gallant state to the rescue of the fallen cause, when he heard of Lee's surrender. He tried for many days to cross the Mississippi, several times, as he says, hotly chased by Federal cavalry through the wood and cane breaks. But at last, making a virtue of necessity, he surrendered to General John W. Davidson at Natchez on the 31st of May. End of chapter 1